Hi, Doug. Hi, Bob. Nice to be with you. Good to have you here. Thanks for taking the time. Let me introduce us. I am Robert Wright, uh, publisher of the Non-Zero Newsletter. This is a Non-Zero podcast. You are Doug Lagore of the Rand Corporation. Correct. Now, you have uh, studied a lot of areas of public policy and actually worked in them. Formerly, you were in the government. Uh, but the part of your expertise I want to tap into has to do with what I think, and I think you may agree, is an underappreciated problem facing humankind, which is that we have in outer space an infrastructure of growing importance, thousands of thousands of satellites on which more than we realize depends in terms of the everyday functioning of corporations, of of governance, of, of the military, and so on. And it's more fragile, I think, than most people realize. Uh, more vulnerable to ultimately catastrophic accidents even and 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 ultimately catastrophic, you know, malicious uh, behavior, uh, possibly of a military kind, possibly of a terrorist kind, who knows? Uh, but it's really, it's really, uh, you know, it's something I've thought about for a, a, a long time, but I don't know enough to know how worried I should be. Uh, and so you're going to, you're going to help illuminate that question. Uh, you came to my attention when you wrote a piece not long ago for War on the Rocks, when you said uh, we need to amend the 1967 uh, Outer Space Treaty, which is sometimes called the Magna Carta of Outer Space. Um, but I, And I want to get to that and, and all the stuff I just mentioned, but I want to start with a question that may seem kind of out of the blue. And it has to do, it's in the context of the Ukraine war. There's a guy on Twitter you probably hadn't, haven't heard of. He's a Russian. Uh, his, uh, his name is Anatoly Carlin. He has a, an influential American following because he, he's fluent in English. He's very smart. He's very conversant in Western culture. He's witty. He's clever. Uh, and not long ago, he proposed, this was, um, after the, the, the Nord Stream pipeline, uh, detonation, he proposed something and you never know when this guy's kidding. But, but, you know, and he, he's pro-Russia, pro-invasion. And he, he recommended that Russia do some, what he's calling weaponized Kesslerization. So before we get to what exactly he has in mind, I want you to tell us what the so-called Kessler effect or the Kessler syndrome is in outer space. It's something that's, I think, never happened, but apparently something that serious people worry about. Uh, sure. Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, and let me just say I agree with all the the hot button issues and points that that you articulated, Bob, uh, in in your introduction with respect to the Kessler syndrome. Um, and let me just caveat this: I I am a, a lawyer by training. I'm not a physical scientist, um, but as I understand it, and that as as my research has um, allowed me to understand it, um, the Kessler syndrome was something that was um, uh, researched by Dr. Kessler of NASA back in the 70s. And basically, what he did was he calculated out uh, with the number of objects that we are sending up into low Earth orbit. Uh, either you know th through uh, debris that's that's created by the launches, or the objects themselves, the satellites, the, the space stations, and, and and other uh, objects that may get set up, that we will reach a point where there is so much that's uncontrolled that we cannot maneuver, um, that these things will start crashing into each other, and that this this becomes a cascade effect. So debris crashes into each other, creates more debris, and that traveling thousands of meters per second runs into more debris. Um, and basically what happens is you reach a point where that orbit, that particular orbit around the Earth becomes unusable. You can't send anything back into it because it will immediately be destroyed or quickly be destroyed. And it, it's difficult to send something through it um, if you want to go to geostationary orbit or a higher orbit. So um, we don't know when 
the, the science isn't um, accurate enough yet, or we don't have enough data to predict when something like that will happen. Depends on a lot of factors, obviously, how much, uh, what our launch capability is, how much we use it. Um, and, you know, malicious, you brought up, you know, the, the, the aspect of malicious or even negligent behavior can, can increase the risk of a, of a Kessler syndrome. Um, some scientists will say, well, we're in it now because we've had collisions and we're having collisions. Um, and it's just not at the point yet where we're losing um, access to the orbit. Um, but yes, if somebody were to be very malicious or very ne nefarious, um, they could simply launch uh, a rocket into a particular orbit with an explosive on board um, that could do significant damage to that orbit in the, uh, in the objects in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the point he was making was that... Uh... Ukraine and the U.S. are making better use of space assets than Russia is on balance, that in particular, U.S. surveillance is a huge military asset sure. for Ukraine. And so if you just randomly blew stuff up in space, on balance, uh, the Russian war effort would benefit tremendously. And he even said, you know, they wouldn't have to directly attack any U.S. space uh, assets, so it wouldn't even be you know, so that obviously malicious. I think everyone would get the idea. Right. Uh, and of course, you would hesitate to do it for the same reason you'd hesitate to detonate a nuclear weapon. The blowback from the world would be very, very negative and so on. But the point is, this is actually, you know, in principle doable and, and would might actually make strategic sense for Russia. I, it's, I don't think it's going to happen but it's just interesting to me that there's a guy uh, talking about it. And of course, we know that that Russia, like the U.S., has tested anti-satellite weapons. They have the capacity sure. to blow up the satellites and see where the junk goes, you know. And they, they, they did it last year, Bob. Right. So. And in fact, the, the International Space Station, I gather, had to engage in evasive maneuvers or, or for exactly. the sake of uh, to be on the air on, the, on the side safe of caution. Side. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the way anti-satellite weapons work is they just smash the thing. I mean, the kinetic one, the, 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 you send up a rocket and it runs into a satellite. Now, you said in your, uh, in your, your piece that two, two things that you thought particularly signified our failure to get as serious as we need to about this stuff are the problems of, on the one hand, space debris, uh, Kessler effect being one example, and the on the other being anti-satellite weapons tests and our failure to meaningfully control those. Um, why don't we uh, before we get back to debris? Let's let's talk a little about the threat of anti-satellite weapons. And we, before we talk about the challenge of regulating them or the challenge of arms control, just um, how catastrophic could that get? I mean, what, what's like the nightmare scenario? If we continue on the path we're on, which is that uh, all the great powers have tested, you know, China, Russia, the U.S. have tested anti-satellite weapons, including kinetic ones. I believe the U.S. Is, and some other countries have recently said they're going to do a moratorium, but correct. But the, but there's the no US, agreement yeah. on that. There's no, no there's no ASAT treaty, right? No, there is no ASAT treaty. Um, the U.S. unilaterally declared a moratorium back in April, and I think six or seven countries have um, recently uh, agreed that they will also have a moratorium. Some of the countries like New Zealand, though, don't have an ASAC capability. So it's more, you know, notional. Uh, the, the problem with not with the international community not coming together and in creating a binding uh, treaty or protocol uh, banning ASAC tests is that this is a way for emerging um, countries to sort of prove their capability. Um, you know, this is what India did. This is what, what China did. Um, but the debris is, is that it creates is tremendous. China has created something like two to 3,000 uh, pieces of debris that are some of which may be in uh, orbit for decades, if not centuries. So uh, on the one hand, you know, it, it's it's fine for the great powers now to say, well, we've done our ASAT tests. We've proven our capability. We don't want now, you know, sort of paternalistically, we're going to say to everybody else, you can't do it. Um, that's, you know, it's difficult to negotiate that. 
Um, but I think it, it, the leverage point here, Bob, is that every single nation has a steep interest in having a, a ASAT test ban, kinetic <laughs> ASAT test ban, uh, because of the Kessler syndrome and because of our increasing reliance on, on space for weather, remote sensing, communications, money, money uh, um, electronic tr- transfers, position navigation and timing. Um, so it, it just doesn't make sense from a practical speaking standpoint to continue with ASAT tests. You know, the, the, the problem is, you know, w- we, we have not had a country come out and say that they're unlawful, right? So there's this, this, this tacit understanding amongst countries that, you know, they can still do it and still be in compliance with the Outer Space Treaty, um, which is one of the things that, that, that we're studying at, uh, at RAND to say, well, is it really in compliance with the Outer Space Treaty? Or can we reinterpret the Space Treaty with, with an amendment to say that, no, ASAT testing creates harmful interference, if not harmful contamination under the treaty, and mm-hmm. doing so will be a breach. Mm-hmm. Do you have any sense for how uh, substantial the anti-satellite arsenals currently are? I mean, I gather that one challenge of doing arms control is that you don't, it doesn't take a super fancy ballistic missile to, beca- to turn into an anti-satellite weapon, right? We have a lot of ballistic missiles, and Russia does, and, so, and China does. So um, is, is, is that part of it almost out of control already? Like if, we, if the U.S. or Russia wanted to suddenly take out, specify like a dozen satellites and take them out, could they do that like today? I mean, I, I, I don't have a handle on what their capabilities are um, that I haven't looked at. But I will say that launch capability is proliferating. Mm-hmm. Um, and China, Russia... In the U.S. have you know incredible launch capability in terms mm-hmm. of sending something up into orbit that could blow up, um, and it's becoming cheaper to do that. Companies are doing it. SpaceX is doing it. Um, uh, Blue Origin is doing it. So there, uh, the the capability and the knowledge, uh, the intellectual um, property and the knowledge is out there. So mm-hmm. it's going to become an increasing problem. Um, for you know, as as all nations develop this capability, mm-hmm. and all you have to do with your with your missile is bump into the satellite, right? It's not like you have to even time a detonation; you just have to crash Correct. into it, and just stuff, to, stuff go, it's incapacitated, and stuff goes flying. Yeah, people don't understand how fragile the satellites are, and and how easy it is. Um, you can bump them, you can nudge them. Um, you know, a, a, a ten centimeter object. Can disable it because of the, the physics of, of, of the situation. Because the two things are going so fast, right? That's mm-hmm. that's that's the problem. And you can't you can't put armor on a satellite. It's too heavy. Um, so they're 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 naturally uh, very fragile. You can make them smaller and more maneuverable. That certainly is helpful. And that's the idea behind mega constellations. Uh, but still, that those objects have to go in a path. So mm-hmm. if you put something in that path. You know, with enough speed, they may you know even a even a, 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 a very maneuverable satellite may not be able to get out of the way. Okay, and so first of all, you can you can given given what space debris can do potentially in a cascading way to wipe out to to damage the whole larger infrastructure. You can imagine how kind of crippling that could be for planet Earth. But but I. I I assume there's a second danger, which is that if you imagine two adversaries that are nuclear armed and have their, you know, are, are, are apprehensive to begin with, and we're now approaching that very situation at this moment, and, and one of them kind of suddenly gets significantly blinded, right? Like, like reconnaissance, reconnaissance satellites that they depend on go out of whack. Uh, I can imagine that making them more apprehensive. They start wondering whether it is or is not, whether that's a part of an attack, and also whether, you know, it removes a layer of reassurance, right? I, I mean, you, 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 you like to think, well, we would have time to make sure that those are Russian missiles headed for us or for Europe. But the more your, your real-time surveillance capabilities are compromised, 
the less confidence you have and the more inclined you might be to launch something on the basis of relatively little evidence that you are actually under attack, right? Yeah, the, the, the potential for misperception, misunderstanding uh, in space is, is really quite extraordinary because it's difficult to, um, to assign attribution to an object, mm -hmm. particularly debris, right? Because it's it's small, and a, you know, an errant wrench doesn't know whether it's Russian, Chinese, or or American. Um, and in many cases, you, it may be difficult to determine whether a sat one of your own satellites is taken out by debris or taken out by an intentional act, an intentional use of force. Mm -hmm. Russia net, it tested a satellite that is basically a nesting doll. It's it's capable of releasing other objects while it's in flight. So that object essentially becomes a weapon or it may look like a piece of debris. And by, and by um, uh, um, creating these threats, it, it leads to exactly what you say, right? If I lose a high value asset, right? Um, with, if I'm not sure whether I lost it with, a, with a, you know, a use of force, an intentional use of force or otherwise, I may react differently and I may want to respond. And this is also a problem with dual use technology. So if I have a satellite arm, I can use it to repair a satellite, but I can also use it if I come up alongside another satellite to disable that satellite, right? Right. So how do I distinguish when there's a use of that arm or some other on-orbit servicing, fueling, whatever, how do I distinguish harmful intent from anodyne intent? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, generally, you know, in the world of of, you know, the air and land domain uh, in the sea domain, we have rules of warfare that allow you to to discern intent. But we don't have those in space. There's no rule for how, you, how close you can get to another satellite. So this this just multiplies the risk. Mm -hmm. So the things we naturally develop. Uh, with the best of intentions, just to do things like service satellites, maybe mm -hmm. refuel them, recharge their batteries, fix them, are potentially very nefarious technologies in, in the <laughs> sense that they, right. they would allow you to disable uh, other satellites, possibly without detection, right? Because it's not like you're, you're firing a rocket up in this case and taking out a satellite, which I assume that leaves a pretty prominent signature. But if you've got these things that can kind of maneuver around, I mean, I don't know what, I don't know how hard it is to sense what's going on in space, but I would assume that this would uh, create the prospect of sabotage that's harder, Trace. Is you, I, I think the, the military in particular has a good sense um, and very good tracking of its own assets. So they can tell when another um, object is approaching um, their, their you know, their satellite. Attribution can be a, a, a little, can be trickier, you mm -hmm. know, whether it's a Russian satellite or a, um, a, a Chinese satellite, uh, but that capability is there. The, the, where it breaks down is when things become really, really small. Um, mm -hmm. And then it becomes very difficult to attribute uh, who's responsible for that object. Yeah. Now, so it sounds like all of this makes uh a kind of effective anti-satellite weapons treaty uh, challenging. I mean, I guess there are, two, there are two versions of this. You can ban testing. That's probably not so hard to monitor, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, yeah, but, but as far as keeping, making sure countries don't have the weapons, that, that horse is out of the barn, kind of, because, because of right. the variety of technologies that can disable satellites, some of which we're already in profuse possession of. Right. And, and, and many of these, because they're dual-use technologies, many of these technologies, we want, you know, uh, countries who have satellites, and, and there are over, I think, 80 countries now who have ownership or part ownership of a satellite. Um, we want you know, these technologies to exist so that we can service the satellite, so, they, so that we can have a more sustainable space, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and, and by, by doing on-orbit on orbit servicing, you can increase the lifespan, decrease and mitigate against debris. And you can also, in, in many cases, 
if it if it does become derelict, you can push it into a graveyard object, right? But if you can push a, a, a derelict satellite into a graveyard object, you can you can push a uh, you know a military satellite into one as what well. What is is graveyard just mean so far out in orbit that it's not going to mess with the vital stuff? Correct. It's it's not in low Earth orbit or in geostationary orbit um, where it can cause a, a problem or a collision or what they call a conjunction. Okay. So uh, an actual a treaty that would reassure us that no one has an anti-satellite weapon is probably hopeless, but we haven't even managed to get an anti-satellite weapons testing Correct. treaty done. And, and in a way, that's surprising because... You know, if you look back at what happened with nuclear nonproliferation treaty, it was like several great powers had nukes and they looked at each other and said, you know, what would be best for all of us is if we just kept all these little guys from having nuclear weapons. Right, and right, that has exactly. more or less worked. And there's been yeah. some proliferation. Yeah. But you would think at this point, Russia and China and the U.S. would look at each well, Of course, they're not doing a lot of talking these days. And that's a problem we'll come to maybe. But but you'd think it would be in their mutual interest. Say, OK, we all know we can do this. We all know we right. can blow up satellites. Why don't we get everybody to sign on to a treaty saying we won't test these weapons anymore, which after all, create dangerous space debris every time you do it yep. and, and so on, right? So why has there been no serious initiative in this direction or? There, there really hasn't been a serious initiative. The, the UN has an open-ended working group right now. Um, it started uh, last year. The UK uh, submitted a resolution to start a... Um, uh, basically a conversation on this. Um, and so there's an open-ended working group. They are working towards addressing norms of behavior and threats. And the idea is that, you know, ASAT testing and, and other um, uh, 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 behaviors that are, that are negative or problematic are on the table for discussion. And hopefully we can come to, um, you know, some initial steps towards a binding rule. At some point, so that that the talk has started, um, you know, the, the problem is it, it's slow. Um, consensus based organizations like the U, UN are naturally slow. You have a lot of countries who, again, will say, look, you developed this technology. You can use it. Now you're telling me I can't test it. Well, then you need to give me the technology. Right. You need mm -hmm. to transfer the technology uh, that you developed that you're telling me I can't develop. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, there's there's varying levels and types of bargaining positions that, that are mm. that are going into this. But I totally agree with you. Um, everybody's interest is in no more ASA testing. Now, North Korea has not tested one of these yet. Uh, no, because I would think that would be a good way to get people's attention. <laughs> why, don't we, why don't we get this under control before North Korea? starts? you know, because yeah. that's a country. If you try to imagine countries that would actually be willing to piss off the entire world no, by turning space into a nightmare, you yeah. know, I, I haven't seen flatly irrational behavior on the part of their regime yet. They haven't done anything truly suicidal, but I keep that in mind. And then, of course, there is the, the, the question of terrorism, right? What, what kinds of Correct. terrorism are foreseeable, uh, uh, terrorist capabilities are foreseeable in the nearest term? Do, do they? Does a terrorist have to get a hold of like a pretty sophisticated ballistic missile system or what to do any kind of terrorism in outer space? You know, I, I think that this is an understudied area, Bob. We, we are not assessing this in terms of risk and threat. Um, you don't need a ballistic missile. You don't need a high-tech ballistic missile capability. All you need is launch capability and a rocket sizable enough to put you know, up into a certain orbit, um, uh, explosives, and then just blow it up. So any, you know, there are nine, 10 countries that have uh, launch capability, but now there are actors that have launch capability like like SpaceX and, and Blue Origin. Mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, you can imagine, you know, a, a terrorist group trying to develop you know, that, that type of technology or hacking into a system that will allow it to control a space object or uh, interfere with the launch, right? Um, in many ways, the cyber risk might be even higher 
uh, because you don't have to develop the physical capability, but you just get in into the systems. Um, and I don't know that we have, um, I you know, I don't know that, that the, the great powers or anybody has really studied this issue thoroughly enough uh, to assess what the risks are because technology and countries and actors are moving at such a fast pace already. Mm -hmm. right? um, we're talking about putting up mega constellations. I don't know if we're really sure about how secure those mega constellations are. Mm -hmm. And uh, so where, I gather that since the Outer Space Treaty in 1967, I think there were a few other significant treaties that came in fairly Correct. rapid succession. Yep. And then there was a period after which, since which there's just been no progress in terms of major space treaties, right? I mean, when did the, when did the period of uh, end of kind of, Space Treaty fertility. It started in '67, and then and then what lasted a decade or so? Or it, it really ended in '78 with the Moon Treaty, which only got eight, 18 signatories. So the the, the, the Outer Space tri tri Treaty, the Liability Convention, um, the the Registration Convention, um, and there's um, one more that's slipping my mind. Those happened in rapid succession from '67 to '72, I think. And then, and then the moon, the moon the treaty moon that treaty. has very few signatories, which yes. would have done what? I, I mean, I guess does something among those eighteen countries. What is the moon treaty? The, the the idea of the moon treaty was was uh, more more uh, related to resources and resource extraction. Mm -hmm. So the, the the moon treaty basically states that space is the common heritage of mankind, and what that term means in international law is it's common. It's common ownership. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's, a, it's a common pool re resource. Uh, so it would, for example, arguably prohibit going to the moon, mining those resources in a country or a company owning those resources. Um, so, you know, that, that's, I mean, that's arguably the way to, to, to interpret the Outer Space Treaty, but it sort of put more, more definition on, on the resource extraction and other aspects like that. Um, and you know the moon. The moon treaty did. The moon treaty did. Okay. And the major spacefaring nations uh, begged off because they didn't want to commit um, to uh, you know basically automatically sharing any resources that were extracted. So the and US it could, didn't it could apply to spectrum too. It could apply to uh, um, how many uh -huh. satellites you can have in an orbit as well. So the U.S. didn't sign the moon treaty. It did not. So the Outer Space Treaty, the so-called Magna Carta of Outer Space, what does that do? So the, Magna, the, the, the Outer Space Treaty is, you know, sort of the, the, the fundamental document. It's, it's about 2,500 words. It's short. It's principle-based. So, for example, Article 2 of the, of the Outer Space Treaty is one of the most significant and basically says that there, there is no such thing as appropriation in outer space. For the for the for the for sovereignty, so you can't I mean, you own can't, the moon. You can't claim you can't, okay, a, a yeah, celestial you can't, body, right? You can't, um, and and technically you can't. You couldn't claim an orbit either. Like you can claim geostationary orbit as being owned by the United States, um, and you can't occupy or use space in a way that would establish sovereignty. Right? Um, but it does other things too. It it says that you know countries have to act with respect to due regard. Uh, with respect to each other, so this due regard that would that would um, you know bring into the conversation ASAT testing. If I mm -hmm. conduct an ASAT test, am I am I, am I am I acting in due regard to you and your interests? Probably not, right? Um, it also establishes a baseline liability. So if I launch something and it falls back and hits an aircraft or hits something on Earth, that's absolute liability for that country. Mm -hmm. um, in space, it's fault liability. So if I if if I cause um, damage in space and it's determined to be my fault, um, then that country is 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 responsible. However, we it, we don't have defined rules with respect to how to determine fault. So that's really kind of a a, a nullity at this point. Um, it it does several other things. It 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 ensures that. Nations have jurisdiction and control over its citizens and actors who launch from that nation. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you launch from the United States or United States has jurisdiction over that launch, it's the United States that's responsible 
for that object and uh, the jurisdiction and, and mm-hmm. control of that object. Not, not necessarily ownership, but you know. So, so, so SpaceX is is regulated by the FCC, the FAA, mm-hmm. and other agencies that have uh, power over it with respect to its launches. At the same time, if we said to SpaceX or any company, no, you can't launch this, we think it's too dangerous, or it would blah, 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 they can just go find another country to launch from, right? They can. Um, that and, and there was a company, uh, Swarm Technology, that did exactly that. They, um, uh, several years ago, they, 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 they were not um, in compliance with or, or did not want to be in compliance with a certain FCC regulation, I believe it was. So they launched, I think, in, out of India. Mm-hmm. Um, but because they were operating within the United States, they were still fined because they had, you know, they, they had mm-hmm. satellite control operations within the United States. Um, so the United States will, you know, through its, through its jurisdiction and in, in, in the space market, so to speak, can reach out and, and, and touch countries. Um, but you're essentially right. If, if I wanted to, you know, basically say, well, I don't have, I don't want to have anything to do with U S and its regulations. I'm going to incorporate overseas. Uh, I'm going to pay a bunch of money to this, to this, to this nation to allow me relatively free reign, um, then a company could do that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the, uh, so the Outer Space Treaty of 67, I got that got a lot of sign on, right? Uh, 167 nations. That's, yes. that's a large, large majority of the nations in the world. And does it, you said it's, it, it's principle based, and that's kind of one, I guess, well, I guess it has pros and cons being principle based, yeah. but not a lot of specificity. But I gather a pretty straightforward interpretation of that is that you're not supposed to create space debris. Is that right? Well, see, that's that's what I would argue is that it doesn't do that okay. because because it doesn't because it's it simply requires uh, countries to avoid or not create interference and contamination, um, but doesn't define either one. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, it 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 has not been used by countries. To, for example, say that ASAT testing is a violation. Now, it, it doesn't define other things either. It doesn't define due regard. It doesn't define space, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, some people say space is where you lose aeronautic control of your mm-hmm. of your craft. Some people just some countries define space as no, you have to you have to be in orbit. You have to be able to go around. And you can imagine that how you define space, well, you might have aeronautic rules or you mm-hmm. might have no rules, right? Um, and countries have, have not been um, anxious to define space. Um, it doesn't define debris, right? It doesn't define what a piece of debris is. Um, and because the Outer Space Treaty provides for jurisdiction and control of the nation, launching nation, over those objects... Then technically, you know, you can't go up and salvage a piece of debris that's owned by another nation without the mm-hmm. permission of that nation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, 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 you know, there, there's all these issues with with the with the ambiguous terminology. Now, of course, the countries at the time liked that because it allowed them to operate, right? So, so another good example is the Outer Space Treaty. One sort of hard and fast rule is you won't put nuclear weapons in orbit. Right. Is now that that rule that, that, derives from what? Is that that's in the text or that's in the text? Right? Okay. Oh, well, that's reassuring, I guess. <laughs> but uh, immediately after the treaty was signed, uh, the U.S. You know, the, uh, Robert McNamara kind of famously said, "Well, in orbit means you have to go around the Earth once." So, mm. by that definition, I can put. A nuclear ICBM into our orbit, as long as it doesn't go around the United the the Earth and but comes back down and hmm. lands on somebody, right? So that's what we call a perverse incentive structure, <laughs> I think. Which is that if you put a nuclear in outer space, you have to make sure it destroys a city or something. But right. anyway, yeah, uh, and, and 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 so, you, but you can see, right? Like the states immediately started interpreting these ambiguous terms in a way that would that would benefit them. Um, if you ask a scientist, most scientists I ask to say, well, what's, what's, in, what's in orbit? Well, orbit has to do with altitude and velocity. So it doesn't matter whether you go around the Earth 
It matters what your altitude and your velocity mm -hmm. is. So arguably, you know, an ICBM could be a violation of the Outer Space Treaty if it were, if it were um, interpreted differently. Mm -hmm. And in fact, at the time that McNamara came, came out with this proclamation, there were uh, Department of State attorneys who cautioned against it and who took the position that it was a violation of the treaty. Um, but you can see, to your point, what that would have done to the ICBM arsenal, mm. right? It would have made it essentially illegal. Yeah. At least to, to use it. To use it. Correct. Right. Yeah. So it would have, yeah. Well, that might have been nice. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so just, I mean, it, it's kind of amazing that uh, we, all these countries are, are relying critically on all these assets in outer space. And we haven't even come up with an explicit agreement that none of us is allowed to screw the whole thing up with, with like space debris, right? Correct. Even that, even that, I mean, that doesn't seem like, like a supervisionary kind of accomplishment, right? To just say, hey, why don't we just not do the most obvious thing we shouldn't do? But there's no written agreement let alone some kind of enforcement mechanism, there's not even an agreement. Right, exactly. And this is what I argue in the, in, in the, in the article, and this is what we're trying to research here at RAND, is, um, you know, we need to start sectioning off these really serious problems and start work, working on them. If we can't get a whole new treaty, then let's at least start with something like debris. Right. And mm -hmm. let's work on that. Or let's work on space traffic management. Let's work on something where, as you know, everybody has a significant interest in it. Um, you know, the, the, the problem is, you know, there's there's a lot of interests um, that, you know, are, are, are not interested in building consensus um, because, you know, right now it's a. And some people think it's a wild west. Some people think it's, you know, it's not a wild west because you have the outer space treaty, but you have uh, a lot of freedom to act. And I would argue that that's the problem, right? The, the, the norm is actually creating space debris. You would think it should be the opposite, but the norm is we continue to create more and more space debris. Uh, and something has to be done about it. And, 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 and why, why is that the norm? What are some routine ways we create it, Le leaving aside the occasional anti-satellite weapons test? So we create it, every launch creates a certain amount of debris, right? Because you have pieces that fly off the, the launch vehicles them, themselves. Uh, and that actually creates a lot of debris. There, um, we don't have, you know, reusable rockets in there in, in you know, Elon, in Elon Musk does, doesn't he? Well, he he does, but you know this is this is this is new, right? Yeah. Most most rockets used by the U.S., the Chinese, and Russians create more and more debris with every time they launch. The uh, the other so they, they don't even fall back to Earth intact. Well, many do. So so depending on how high it is, depending on its altitude, it can fall back and burn up. So, so there are debris mitigation guidelines that countries are supposed to, to follow to ensure that as much junk debris from a launch as possible falls back and burns up. And right? are those guidelines like written and agreed upon by nations or what? They're written, but they're voluntary, mm -hmm. right? So they're not agreed upon in terms of any sort of compliance mechanism or binding effect. And what's more problematic is we don't measure compliance, Bob. So mm -hmm. even if China says they're following debris mitigation and their launches, you know, 95% of their launch material that's, that's debris falls back and burns up in the atmosphere, we're, there's no way to uh, ensure that that's actually the case, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is why debris keeps growing is because we know there isn't compliance to these voluntary measures. The other source of debris is, you know, these, these, these objects break and stop working, right? Um, and they can't be maneuvered. And so they instantly just become a piece of junk floating around up there and Do again, they, crashing I, into each other. So I would imagine them continuing to go in some kind of orbit thanks to some physical law, but right. what, what they, they slowly drop out of the orbit or what? It takes time though. 
Um, yeah. So it's a function of weight. It's a function of altitude. It's a function of velocity. So, you know, for example, the U.S. maintains that in their ASAT test back in 2008, I think it was, all of the particles created have burned up because the, the strike was so low in the, mm-hmm. in the, in the mm-hmm. atmosphere mm-hmm. And, the, and the weight of the objects was heavy enough to drag them in. Um, but, you know, depending on where something is uh, altitude wise and speed, it can remain in orbit for, for decades or centuries. And when you have an explosion and you have a, co- a conjunction, a collision, a lot of times the, the, the pieces will, uh, will, will project outward. So some will go to higher orbits, some will go to lower orbits, mm-hmm. and there's no way to control that. Other times, satellites that are old, their batteries, they have fuel on board, but they're derelict, they can explode mm-hmm. where they are. And again, they'll push certain types of, they'll push certain debris into a higher level, some in a lower level. So it's just, it's a very, it's a, it's a mess, right? It's, it's a mess, and it's very, very difficult to clean up. And these treaties in between the Outer Space Treaty and the Moon Treaty, the, the beginning and the end of the kind of space treaty era, did those three treaties sandwiched in there, did they do some significant and valuable stuff? Uh, they, they did. So, and the other treaty is, is the, um, the astro, what they call the astronaut treaty. Okay. So, so the registration treaty requires you to register the, any object you put up into space. So countries have to register the objects that they launch. Okay. Um, it doesn't provide a lot of information though. Um, and a lot of classified objects, satellites are not in the registry or not sufficiently in the registry to to determine what they're doing, right? Um, so it does it does provide some baseline database, right, mm-hmm. for, for objects that get launched. Uh, the astronaut treaty it, it relates to if there's an emergency, um, you have to help other nations astronauts. So, for example, on the on the International Space Station, um, there's reciprocity. If something goes wrong. The Russians help the U.S. U.S. help 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 the Russians, and this would this would apply on the moon. This would apply anywhere in space. So mm-hmm. you have a, a, an obligation to cooperate and collaborate if there's a safety issue or an emergency issue. The liability con- convention, which I which I mentioned earlier, spawns from an uh, article within the OSD, and it basically um, you know provides for. It, again, it doesn't define fault in in orbit, so it's it's not helpful uh, mm-hmm. for debris in orbit. But if something does fall back to Earth and you know hits you know hits you and hits your office, um, that country is responsible. So it becomes a political process in terms of payment and in negotiation. There's no there's no court you can go to, um, but at least liability in that sense is assigned. Mm-hmm. Okay. And do you have any sense for why this era of like space treaties came to an end? Was it was it partly that the last one was just not successful in terms of gathering a lot of signatories or uh, what? Because, I mean, the funny thing is you'd kind of think, you know, these these things happened during the Cold War. So there's actually some progress during the right. Cold War as there were with other arms control treaties. Then I guess the whole, if we remember the golden era and we thought the Cold War was over and another one wasn't going to start, which apparently turned out to be wrong, um, there was a lot of time, but there was no, yes. there were there were no treaties during that time. Uh, so why do you do you have a theory as to why the period of progress uh, stopped, even though the need for these kinds of agreements only grew? Yeah, I, I one of the reasons I think I mean I think. The Moon Treaty did put sort of a bad taste in a lot of the spacefaring nations' mouths in terms of, um, you know, the the difference in interest between powerful spacefaring countries and, and low low income, uh, least developed countries. You know, they're, they're, the interest started to diverge. Um, the other uh, incentive is, um, you know, when you when you have less. When you have less regulation and you have these ambiguities, it really allows innovation to flourish. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, spacefaring countries got addicted to that, right? Um, They could go up, they could test something, they could create some debris, it's no big deal. Um, You know, 
There, there is opportunity to allow an industry to grow, a space industry to grow, without having a, a treaty obligation, um, insist on a number of, you know, fine, uh, finely tuned or, or described regulations, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think people, I think countries and, and industry and commercial interests get used to that. Right, they get used to that autonomy. They get used to that freedom, and then they they want to you know sort of naturally oppose anything that would disrupt that. Um, the problem I see with that is that it's very short sighted. So yes, you know, for example, you might have developed maneuverability in your satellite that can beat the maneuverability of any of anybody else. So you can avoid all the debris that's up there. Mm-hmm. That's fine for you, right? So making making it, you know, putting regulations on you that that make your production more expensive um, don't necessarily help you, and you might av- want to avoid that. The problem is, at some point, you're not going to have the maneuverability you need, right? So it's really about getting out ahead of the next catastrophe. Mm-hmm. But we're not good at, as human beings doing that. Right. We typically wait for a catastrophe and then say. Oh boy, were we wrong? We really missed the boat on on regulating uh, maneuverability and, and proximity and debris creation. Um, you know, we did this. This was this was a problem with uh, UNCLOS, with the Convention on the Law of the Seas, right? Um, you know, it took the Torrey Canyon spill in the nineteen six early nineteen sixties or late mid, mid to late nineteen sixties, I think. It took the Torrey Canyon spill. Uh, for countries to get really serious about uh, shipping rules regarding hazardous materials like mm-hmm. oil, right? Um, and and we got a treaty out of it that you know really um, put regulations on industry that that had long been needed. But you know, people in France and England had had to lose their livelihoods, right? And 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 didn't know how they were going to put dinner on the table because of the, the massive amount of oil that was spilled in that area. Um, and, and so a lot of times we're just, we're, we're locked in this behavior that, that we, we end up saying oh, hindsight was 2020, you know, mm-hmm. after the catastrophe. And do you have kind of in your head a picture of the kind of catastrophe it is going to take uh, for significant advance in kind of space law and, 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 you know, agreement to it, or, you know, I I guess this is both a question about how bad, uh, how bad would something have to be to focus the world's attention? And also how bad could things get just right, right now? Like what's the worst catastrophe you worry about that's realistic and what's kind of the minimal catastrophe you think it would take to, uh, to get the world's attention? I mean that's that's the sixty four thousand dollar question, Bob. I I you know I don't have a good answer for that. Um, you know, for me, when I first started doing this, when I first started researching this, and I read about the Chinese ASAT test creating two to two to three thousand pieces of debris, and I read about the uh, the iridium collision. So iridium in two thousand nine had one of its communication satellites uh, collide with a derelict Russian satellite, and ahead of that. That was just a disabled Russian satellite. It was just a disabled Russian yeah. satellite. And ahead of that, they were warned by spacetrack.org, which is, you know, um, the U.S. Uh, Spacecom's um, uh, tracking, you know, free tracking service, basically, of, of objects in space. Um, you know, they got notifications that, you know, a potential collision conjunction was going to occur. Mm-hmm. And Iridium did its calculations and said, well, we don't think it's going to occur. And this is another problem because you don't, everybody sort of disagrees where something in space is going, right? Because it tumbles. It's affected by the sun. It's affected by all kinds of environmental um, uh, factors, right? So you need an algorithm that tells you where a derelict piece is going to go. But everybody has their own algorithms and everybody's algorithm is the best, right? Mm-hmm. Well, not in this case. So Iridium, uh, said, well, you know, they made a business decision based on their risk profile to say, we, we don't think it's going to collide. And well, would, we it don't want to... Co- what, would it have been so costly to make the adjustment? 
it's really costly to make an adjustment because you expend fuel, right? Mm -hmm. So companies that have satellites in space want to expend as little fuel as possible because it increases the life of the satellite Mm -hmm. um, to do that. So they're disincentivized um, to to accept low levels of risk. Because the debris is not going to be their problem by and large. It's probably not going to hit one of their satellites. Exactly, right? Exactly. I mean, they lose they lose the satellite. There's that, but still, most of the fallout, you know. Okay, so what did happen? It, it, there was just a, a smash, a smash up in a tiny so debris. It collided. Their their risk analysis was was well. They were they they accepted a higher level risk than than they probably should have. <laughs> um, it collided and it created somewhere in the vicinity of two thousand um, uh, objects that a, a lot of which are still up there. So I would have thought, you know, I read that and I said, well, well, why, why isn't there already an agreement, right? Mm-hmm. So you're asked to me, that's, that's, that's fair. That should be catastrophic enough. Um, but I, what I fear is that because, you know, a lot of people don't know about this, right? That there's not a lot of political will to say that that's unacceptable, right? Mm-hmm. And the only It'll take a it'll take a it'll take a, a much bigger catastrophe to get people's attention to say, oh, we've now lost an orbit, we've now lost, a, you know, five hundred satellites. By an orbit, right. you mean there's a whole kind of uh, ring yes. where nothing can be functional. Nothing is functional, right? And in that ring, we had these, you know, we had a hundred satellite, whatever, that are no longer functional, that are now debris, right? Mm. And Oh, I can't get my sports package anymore. <laughs> that now that now they've gone too far. You want po- you want political action? NFL football. If I if I lose my sports package, now all of a sudden space is really important to me, mm-hmm. right? Um, or you know I can't predict the weather anymore, or I can't do the remote sensing I wanted to do with respect to alg- agricultural mining and fishing and all these other things. Um, I I I fear that it's going to take that level to get notice, right, um, before there's the political will to, to force countries to go to the UN and uh, sit down and get consensus on mm-hmm. some basic common sense rules. Uh, you know, that's, yeah, that, that's my biggest fear right now. And because, is it the case that because more and more stuff is up there, in other words, space is more and more densely populated by satellites, that the Correct. longer you wait, the bigger the catastrophe could be that finally gets your attention because there's just uh, more more spaces occupied, the bigger there could even be one of these cascading things, right? One of these chain reactions. Correct. This is really serious with respect to mega constellations because companies are putting up, you know, planning to put up tens of thousands of satellites. Now they're smaller, uh, but they create tremendous congestion. So like is Starlink so, an example of a mega? What yes. is a mega constellation? That's mega constellation. Theory, is, these are satellites. They're, are they actually launched together and they, they form a kind of consolidated array of satellites and they orbit together? Yes, that's basically exactly what it is. And it can, can range in number, right? You can have, you know, 50, you can have uh, 100. Uh, depends on what, what your objective is and, and what you're trying to do. Um, so OneWeb, you know, Blue Origin, Amazon, uh, SpaceX, they all want to put up in China and, and wants to put up these mega constellations because you can, you can use them for broadband, right? So you can mm-hmm. significantly increase your capability with things like broadband. Uh, the problem is it creates tremendous congestion. And if there is a collision, uh, now you're not losing one satellite, you're losing 50, 100. So you're losing the entire capability, perhaps, of the reason you put the mega, mega constellation up there. Mm-hmm. And there is some point of kind of density beyond which it, the chain reaction itself could be catastrophic. We don't know what that is. We don't know what that is, exactly. It's very, very difficult to predict what that is. But, um, but, but, but scientists are convinced that it, that it could definitely happen. This is the Kessler effect. This is the Kessler syndrome, yep, exactly. Um, so uh, let's see. What what else is there to get depressed about? I mean, <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of astounding when you think about it. Uh, it, it is. And and I'll tell you what. Let me let me uh, quote uh, something from uh, I think your piece. If I can find the quote, 
uh, you wrote in your piece in War on the Rocks, and if people want to Google this, it was the, the, the phrase 1967 Outer Space Treaty was in the headline, I think. And you write, uh, the increasing great power competition between the U.S., the People's Republic of China, and the Russian Federation is making space more dangerous. What did you have in mind by that? So, you know, as, as escalation continues, so particularly, you know, the U.S. and Russia are um, actively trying to build more and more space capability. You know, military, the, the military, military capability. space, space capability. You know, we have a space force now, right? right? China has their version of the space force. Um, so in, in the U.S. Is, is, you know, as you mentioned earlier, we're very heavily reliant on our satellite capabilities um, in, in order to, to have a, a, a functioning military, have our have our eyes and, and be able to maneuver and things like that. Um, you know, the, the problem is, as we continue to, to escalate without rules, right? So we don't, like I said earlier, we don't have a rule for how close a satellite can get to another satellite before it's considered hostile, right? Mm -hmm. So but, you know, just by the numbers, the more satellites we have up there, they spy on each other too. They don't just spy. They don't just look down. They they look at each other. The more the more of a of a and, and you know if we start servicing them, the more threat there is of a mis misperception. Mm -hmm. And it's that misperception that could cause the conflict in space, which then can also lead to a, con a terrestrial mm -hmm. conflict as well. So that's that's my the, the peer competition between Russia, China, and in 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 the U.S. Um, unchecked as it is in space, you know, without the rules necessary, the rules of engagement um, is, I, I think, something we should all be worried about. And, and do you have a sense for what capabilities we're developing or planning to develop as part of this Space Force thing? Which I guess, uh, I mean, I'm sure there had always been Pentagon plans for space, but the Space Force per se was created during the Trump administration. Is that right? Correct. Yes, that's correct. And what, do you have a sense for what, what, I mean, is the idea we want to be able to have battlefield capabilities in space? And I mean, so in other words, like anti-satellite weapons and so on, is, is that the whole idea of Space Force or what? Well, I think that, the, you know, this is, these are all things that the U.S. Air Force was doing, right? Mm -hmm. I think the idea was to just break it off and, and make it its own branch so that theoretically it gets resourced um, in the way that it needs, separate from another branch, um, so that you can continue to develop, you know, in space capabilities like satellites, um, but also, you know, um, you know, the the terrestrial environment, uh, the terrestrial capability that goes with the satellites, right? Observation, tracking, mm -hmm. all of these things that you need uh, to to um, feed the other branches of the military with okay. the information and the capabilities that it that it needs. So I think, you know, the idea we were all we were doing all these things you just described, um, but the idea was to focus um, on it as a particular branch. So it includes the use of space to orchestrate terrestrial warfare, but also presumably anything yes. we're thinking about in terms of actual warfare in outer space. Correct. Yes. I mean, technically, if we develop, you know, um, lunar installations, you know, somebody's going to have to ensure their mm -hmm. protection and their safety, right? So the Space Force would technically have jurisdiction over that. And I think I saw a reference to a RAND Corporation study this year, I think uh, kind of looking at the reaction of Russia and China to the Space Force, among other things. Maybe I'm misremembering, but I, I think the idea was that kind of predictably, they saw the advent of the Space Force as a very offensive and threatening thing, whether even if we saw it as a defensive thing, a kind of asymmetry yeah. of perception that has characterized the entire history of nations. Yeah, I, I think that's that, that that's ex exactly right. It, 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 it's looked upon as escalatory, right, right. Um, by other nations. And, and, and the U.S. would, would point to, to, to China's investment in space um, you know, by the People's Liberation Army as escalatory. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a spiraling, it's a spiraling effect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I guess in closing, uh, I'd just like to 
ask you about something I thought about in the context of cyber weapons and see if it applies to 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 outer space stuff. It, it, it's maybe not obvious that it would, but I was I was uh, interviewing somebody about the kind of about you know cyber uh, the prospect for kind of cyber armaments treaties, you know, like agreeing that you're not going to go in and mess with other people's computers and so on. Right. Uh, and it became clear that this was not a realm where the formal treaty per se could be so effective. I mean, with nuclear weapons, it's one thing where, you know, they're big, they're pretty big, the infrastructure is pretty big. It's not impossible to imagine a monitoring system as we had with right. Iran during the new, when the nuclear deal was action, that you have a it was uh, active that you have a fair amount of confidence in. Cyber weapons a totally different thing. And what I realized in the course of talking to him is that it's a it's an area where um, keeping bad stuff from happening, having rules of the road that are respected, is very like norm dependent. First of all, right. I mean, you want explicit rules, but it's they're going to be sufficiently hard to kind of pervasively monitor that a norms are going to uh, be important. And the other thing I realized is that you are going to need a kind of what you could call organic transparency by that. I mean, not just some kind of official monitoring regime, but the kind of the kind of insight you get into what's going on in other countries by virtue of things like commercial collaboration. Like, for example, mm -hmm. when people were discussing whether or not there was a leak from the Wuhan laboratory, you realize that actually American scientists, they had a little bit of a sense of what goes on in places like that just because they were in collaboration with it. That was like a plus side of international collaboration in science. And, and similarly in the commercial realm, you know, you just, you get a lot of people in your country who kind of have a sense of what's going on. And right. that's what I would mean. That's what I would mean by organic transparency. Anyway, in the realm of cyber, I realized you, we need better rules of the road. We need better written agreements. But ultimately, there's virtue in just kind of uh, collaborative, commercial, and collaborative integration. You might say, and and for that reason, cold wars can be dangerous things, just because right. you have less uh, kind of organic uh, oversight. You might say. Is yeah. is space? Uh, in some ways, seems to me it's not exactly the same. But but it, but and yet there are similar problems with with formal treaties and formal enforcement in some cases. So I don't know what what would you say about that? Yeah, I mean, I I think the balkanization balkanization is is a serious problem that 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 countries are essentially stovepiped and not working together, right? And developing capabilities independent of each other. And you don't often have this moderating influence of commercial activity going back and forth. You know, supposedly the International Space Station was supposed to foster this, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we have the Wolf Amendment, which doesn't allow us to, you know, it doesn't allow NASA and, and, and the space industry in the U.S. to work directly with China. So... It's hard to build those commercial relationships while you're competing with and separating mm -hmm. yourself. Because uh, I would agree with you, oftentimes it's it's industry and, and commercial relationships which are sort of this moderating, mitigating force. But you can only have that when countries and, and companies are working together and then going back to the politicians and saying, look, you know, we need rules because, you know, we have this relationship. Um, with these other, with with these other companies, and it's it's a prosperous relationship, and we all want it. Um, so we need better rules on cybersecurity, and we need a consensus document amongst you politicians, you know, uh, of these nations, in order to in order to to make sure that this prosperity uh, continues. Space is not like that. Space is is very competitive. Um, yes, we do work with our allies. The U.S. works with the U.K. and in Japan, and there's, you know, there's a lot of crossover there. But there's no, there's no crossover amongst the great powers, and mm -hmm. and that's where the conflict could arise. So that's where the, that's where the, um, you know, that, that's where we should be most concerned with. And this was true even before the recent chilling of relations among between us and China and between us and Russia. I think so. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's. Um, 
you know, the, the, the sort of the degradation of the relationship with respect to the International Space Station is a good example, right? Mm-hmm. Russia's going to abandon the International Space Station. China said, well, you never let me on it, so I'm going to build my own. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And so China and its allies will have its space station. You know, we, we will or will not have another space station, um, but there won't be uh, a, an, en- an enmeshment that might help uh, engage security measures. So there's been kind of an ongoing decline in in relations for these purposes. There there was a time when maybe things were more auspicious, but that was a while ago. Yeah, I think that you have really have to go back to the 60s and, and, and 70s. Since then, it's um, you know it's it's been the U.S. and its allies, Russia and China and and and, and their allies. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, is there anything else uh, that you want to you want to alarm us about? Uh, anything high on your list? If, if I haven't done it done it enough already, yeah, we're um, unalarmable. Yeah, I, 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 well, I, you know, I'll leave on a positive note and say that you know I think it's it's forums like this that are helping to get the the information out there, and ultimately what we need to do what. You know, we're trying to do it with RAND and other think tanks and organizations are trying to do to do it too, is inform the public of what the risks are. Um, and that's the way that you'll generate the political will to get the consensus domestically and, and internationally. Um, but it only happens if 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 we have you know podcasts like yours, conferences, seminars, uh, and we don't wait for that catastrophic event. Um, you know what? What might happen next is something will fall out of out of out of space, and instead of landing in a field in Australia, it'll land on an office building in Australia, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we we don't want to have to generate political will that way. I fear that that might be the way we do it. Um, it might be easier if people just lost their sports packages for a couple of weeks. Yeah. That might do it, um, but we'll we'll see. Okay. Uh, well. Either of those are, are better than some scenarios, I guess. Um, well, thank you for taking the time. And finally, is there any 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 place else uh, people should look for your stuff? They can Google that War on the Rocks piece. Anything else you want to steer us to? I don't know if you're on social media or anything. Or so uh, you can follow me uh, on Twitter uh, at at Doug Lagore. Um, Rand always posts all of our work mm-hmm. um, pretty pretty quickly. Puts it out on the Rand social media. Um, we had an article in the in the NATO Legal Gazette not too long ago that talks about a lot of this, um, but um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, if your viewers and listeners were to follow Rand or, or me, um, they could learn a lot lot more about this. Okay, great. Well, thank you for taking the time and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you, Bob. It was a pleasure being with you. Thanks for the invitation.